Thanks so much. Thank you, David, for hosting, for everyone who put together this call. Special shout out to Amy Holtz from the Jewish Future Pledge, which is a worldwide movement that calls on Jews to, play, to pledge half of their charitable giving to the Jewish people and to Israel. Um, and it's just a delight to have uh, Mem and her daughters, Suzanne and Jennifer, with us today. Uh, it, 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 and, and, and I know that many of us won't be celebrating Mother's Day the way that we might have before. We might not be able to, to see our moms. We might not be um, able to, to honor um, our, our mothers. And so what we wanted to do is just spend a few minutes uh, together thinking a little bit about love and living and mothering and giving. And um, we're delighted to have you three join us. So Mem, you have told me that you actually had four mothers, which is a lot of Mother's Day presents. Um, tell us a little bit about growing up. I know it sounds as though my parents divorced and divorced and divorced again, but no. I had four parents because I grew up in an apartment house in the Bronx with two aunts and uncles, a grandparent, and two, a set of grandparents, and my own parents. So every time the ice cream truck rolled down the street and somebody said, Dad, can I have a nickel? Four hands went into the pocket. And every time I needed my hem hemmed on my dress, I had to get approval from four different mothers as to the length of the dress. So I had one set of parents and many supporting sets of parents. Yeah, that's uh, special to, to have kind of that much love and maybe that much advice. Um, uh, Suzanne, Jennifer, jump in. Tell me a little bit about Mem as a mom. Uh -oh. Well, first I would say, I don't know that that would have felt so special at the time. <laughs> right. There wasn't a lot of room to be bad. Right. Um, Sue, do you want to go first? Um, Let's see, see. I'm glad we don't have four Mems. <laughs> One is enough. One is enough. Um, I would say that my mom parented us, we sort of joke about this, parented us as though we were 40. She spoke to us like we were 40 and we were expected to always um, behave. behave. <laughs> and we, we understood that there were high expectations on us as human beings, not necessarily at the academic level, but to be great humans. And- um, What a lovely, what a lovely gift. Yeah, they instilled- I'm loving this whole thing because <laughs> we don't get to do this often and we're mothers and daughters, so we only hear, you know, the bickering, but- We're gonna let her do this once a month, not today. <laughs> And then, of course, all the grandchildren are around now. So Suzanne and I keep getting triggered seeing how she's handling that. <laughs> you know, there was this thing that became a funny thing in our family where our kids don't always listen to us. And mom just had to look across the room or it was the family squeeze. It was right. just like a gentle touch. And we were straight in line. Doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Doesn't work with the grandchildren work anymore. We, it reminded me, we did a wonderful bar mitzvah video for our son recently. And there was a scene with mom coming in in her army gear and a whistle, making everybody <laughs> line up a spoof on men. <laughs> it was so, yeah, it was just a different time. We raised our kids differently. We had different expectations, I think. And it was easier without technology. Yeah, much easier without technology. And I really only come to appreciate that we're all together now, of course, since the virus. So we've been together for almost two months and we're still alive and well. But if the virus doesn't kill us, online learning will. So, you know, it's just been... Mm. This is a time for us to all appreciate teachers. Um, really, so can I ask, um, Mem, as you now have had a bird's eye view, a close up view for the past two months of watching your daughters as mothers. And if you wanted to give each a verbal present for, for, what, for this Mother's Day of what, you, what you're proud of, what you see in them that you admire as mothers. Could you share with us? Yeah, and you know, it, it's, it wells up in me when you ask the question because the truth is, and maybe it's the format in which we're working, but the truth is I see my children raising Jewish kids and I think it's amazing. I mean, they put a, they put a, on good human beings, on, on respect. They, they put emphasis on in my, my opinion. I, I think watching grow up, it made me realize how much they learn from me, good and bad, but largely in this context, the good of 
raising Jewish kids. I thought it had more to do with who made the best challah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I we don't. have a challah competition every Friday night. Right. Well, it's I very don't. fierce. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, certainly they're all good parents. There's no question about it. They parent differently, and each one of their eight children are different. But there's no question if you, you know, woke everybody up in the night and said, who are you? They would say, I'm a little Jewish kid or something like that, because they are. Yeah, beautiful. And, and um, ma'am, you've described growing up poor, and yet, you know, you're now a noted uh, and well-respected philanthropist. Uh, I have to say, as an Abichai fellow, I've been the beneficiary, and I, I take this public opportunity to thank you really profoundly for that in my life. Um, how do you raise, how do you raise philanthropists? As we, you know, wealth comes with its dangers as well as its, um, as its great joys and, 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 and comforts. So I'm wondering how you've negotiated that since you have raised children who are philanthropists and now hopefully another generation of grandchildren who will be philanthropists. Well, look, first I have to say, I raised a family and I raised a Jewish family. And most people who are listening and do know me as the, 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 widow of Bernstein. But the truth is, children were raised in the home of my first husband, Hal Dryan. And together, we created a Jewish home. And that's how we raised them. We didn't raise them as philanthropists. We raised them as young people who were experiencing our success, because my first husband and I had success, and they watched us do our Jewish giving. Um, Jewish day school. Yeah, we created it. Yeah, they, they founded the first uh, South Peninsula Hebrew Day School in the Bay Area. And I was talking the other day with my sister about how we would remember our parents always hosting world thought leaders on Judaism in our, you know, entry to our home. And we'd be hanging and dangling our feet over the banister from above where we should have been in bed, but we wanted to listen to what was going on. And it was exciting and it was inspiring. And there was a lot of conversation at our dinner tables and Shabbat dinners. And we never missed a holiday to celebrate. So it was fun. It was, um, there was a lot of joy in our family around Jewish practices. I think that's true. There was nothing negative about being Jewish in our house. We never had to force anybody to do anything because it was always fun and great. And I think we all felt that. I don't think any one of us ever felt any kind of... No, I, I actually would say that it was a gift and it was a unique gift. And I personally struggle with um, giving my kids the understanding that we were, you know, if, if you if you ask the question about why, you know, why Judaism, it, we, were we were fortunate enough to be born Jewish. And the difference is that we were given this gift and now as adults, you have to choose it. And I think that by choosing it, it's obvious to us that it gives us a rich life. And I do feel that I have a little bit extra. I stand in a room amongst others that weren't given the kind of Judaism that we were given. And that really can hold a person. And that's what's very um, apparent to me, but I struggle with giving that that taste of uniqueness in Judaism to my kids because it's not just Jewish education. You have to have um, you have to believe that that our history and where we come from makes makes greatness and makes for a good life. Right. And um, and that takes you know a lot of years to cultivate. And we were lucky enough, and our kids are lucky enough to have started early. But um, it's a lifelong journey. I mean, even to this day, I have, you know, girlfriends, older girlfriends in their 50s now who have decided to start studying Judaism. And I'm just always in so much awe of them and have so much respect for them because I always say, you know, the path is always open. And that is unique to Judaism. And it's so incredible um, to have that. I will say that, the, I'm sorry, I was just going to say that my Jewish experience growing up came from family life, didn't come from education. And my daughters have a much richer education than I ever had. And I see them continuing to grow in that way. You know, no matter what they're doing, they're growing in Jewishly, yeah, Jewishly and educationally. And I didn't come from that. 
but I certainly valued it. And they went to Jewish day school and all of my grandchildren are in Jewish day school, which is a miracle. I mean, think about that. That is a miracle. I have 10 Jewish grandchildren in day schools. So I was going to add around Jewish identity, you know, I do a lot of meditation and I facilitate, I'm going to be leading for 600 Brandeis University faculty and members today. And I always think Judaism invented mindfulness because it's all about taking everything physical and elevating it to a spiritual level. So we have an appreciation for everything that we can have and do in our lives. And with that appreciation in every moment, we're happier people. They've done studies on this, right? So I think it, it comes with the territory that if you are a practicing Jew in any way, maybe you don't keep 613 laws, but if you <laughs> pick and choose and find what resonates with you, if it's a Friday night dinner, every Friday night where your family can rely on that and you come and you make challah or you break bread together, whatever it is, just in that action, like we say in Jewish tr tradition, na'aseh nishma, do the action first, and then you'll embody an understanding of why you do it, not the other way around, that you need to understand before you do something. I was even thinking about forgiveness this morning, and when we forgive, we set ourselves free. What if it's hard to forgive? What if we just choose to forgive? And then what happens after that? We start feeling the effects of that, slowly but surely. So I think Judaism, I think, has so many lessons. It's less a religion and more a way of life is how we've been raised with it. Yeah, so you're using so many beautiful descriptive words, intentionality and joy and education and mindfulness and a path and a life. Um, I know that there are people who, you know, that Yiddish expression, schwer zu a Yid, it's hard to be Jewish. And they don't realize how burdensome that is of kind of giving the next generation a package of negative memories um, as opposed to, you know, seeing within Judaism this wellspring, this resource, this anchor. Um, I'm wondering if each of you have a particular Jewish ritual or, or mitzvah that's very important to you, um, that either connects you to your family or connects you to yourself. I don't know, if, I don't know who wants to start. Well, well I would say it's just something, um, Something that was very prominent in my Jewish day school experience, the counting of the Omer. I remember it very specifically. And I, um, you know, I, I'm always aware every year of the counting, but this year I took it upon myself to take it very seriously and, um, here's my Omer book, um, <laughs> take it very seriously and also, um, uh, enlist others to study with once a week for each of the um, attributes. And I think that you're right in that you talk about um, connecting to yourself as a ritual, because I think one of the things that makes Judaism so rich and profound is being able to connect when, with oneself at specific times of the year um, in a formal way. And I think that for me this year, or this calendar year, um, the counting of the Omer has been something that is significant. And I think that Judaism gives us a platform, an incredible platform to be able to, um, on that path, take something, you know, for yourself whenever you want it, whenever you need it. And even I would say Shabbat, you know, just being able to turn off from the week that has just passed and reflect on how we can take those lessons into the week ahead. And I know with our children, although we're not Shomer Shabbat, you know, we have this rule that, you know, until four o'clock on a Saturday, you are not to lift a piece of technology. And what we find is Saturday morning, instead of running to cartoons, the kids find games. They play together. They build forts. We have five children. They're like, <laughs> we come down to the kitchen. It's just total mayhem, but they're having a good time. And although they might protest for an instant or two and try, mom, can we turn on the television? They come in at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. What day is it? Uh, it's Shabbat. I don't think so. <laughs> they know the rules and we're pretty strict about it. So I don't know. For me, I think the first thing that comes to my mind and the truth is I consider myself flexidox. I'm orthodox and I consider flexidox. But the truth is I have an ongoing conversation with God. I believe I believe. I don't, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know where it's going. And I don't pray religiously in a synagogue. 
a few belong, times a year. Yeah, a few times, right. <laughs> but I, of course, I belong yes, to so all of them. But I, I feel that there's a God inside me who's listening. Mm. Beautiful. So, uh, so interesting to hear you reflect. I, I want to just talk about Sphere of HaOmer, the counting of the Omer from Passover to Shavuot. Because I think for a lot of us, we're counting time differently. Um, and uh, I noticed myself, I, I mark each day on a calendar. So this is 52 days for us in quarantine, which is longer than the Omer count. And, um, and yet there are things I think that we're going to remember about this time period that you alluded to in terms of family time. I read something um, my, my own daughter passed on to me. Uh, many years in the future, a child is talking to a grandfather and the child says, Dad, Grandpa, how old are you? And he says, I'm 81. Oh, you lived in the time of coronavirus. Yes, I did. And it was a terrible time and there were so many deaths and, um, and, and funerals and, and, and healthcare workers were unprotected. And the grandfather says, you know, I was young and all of that is true, but that's not the way I remember it. I remember how my mom said, instead of, I don't have time for you, I have an idea and how my dad took me fishing and I baked and how our family was together. And I think, I think there's actually, this Mother's Day is a really interesting time to reflect on who we've become as families. Um, not only the hardships, but also the really, the quality time that we've had. I do, I know that this, this conversation is really not about the virus, but it's hard to avoid the context in which we're speaking. Do you have thoughts about how you're making this time meaningful, um, how you as mothers are managing? I can, before my girls answer, because for them it's much different, but for me, I haven't lived with my children in years. This is the first time that we're really together for such a long period of time, and it's been amazing for me. Amazing. I've loved every minute of it. I mean, really, not every, but mostly every minute. <laughs> right. well, I believe you. <laughs> because she's living in her house, not my house. Right. Right. That's so, why we're all happy. Yeah, right. That's why we're all happy. Anyway, um, for me, that it's a family moment, there's no question. And certainly for my grandchildren. I mean, I hear the word grandma a thousand times a day, and I love it. And they see me, they, they, can't, they haven't figured me out yet. It's very funny, but it's great. It's really great. Mm -hmm. I think probably the, the um, most significant piece is twofold. When you talk about um, great teachers, I would say that it's been a glimpse into our mm -hmm. children's classrooms because you're what when you have young children, you're actually seeing the teachers interact with your kids. Right. And I've been, um, I felt in the beginning it was so odd because I felt like, oh my goodness, there's a whole world. I know nothing about that goes on in my child's life. The interaction, the way that, I mean, we have a, an incredible um, um, fifth grade teacher and she's, and she's so engaged in what they're doing and their life and the, the, the um, um, amount of academic and just socialization that goes on in the Zooms, I think is remarkable. In a Jewish and day school. In a Jewish day school, or, I mean, I can't speak for other schools. It's my own, it's my little experience. But um, I think that has been very moving to see, um, to see teachers in action. You know, it's not something you, you generally see unless you work in a school. And the other part is that I secretly, you know, anyone who knows me, I've secretly always wanted to homeschool my kids. So this is just like a dream come true. You know, I, I keep... Has it turned into a nightmare yet? No, it's not a nightmare. Um, it's not a nightmare. What? Have you suspended anyone yet? You no, no, but there's a lot of drinking going on. Don't give her any ideas. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I happened to ask Suzanne's baby, or baby, how old is Jake? 12. Yeah. I asked him yesterday if he prefers this kind of learning or would prefer to be back in school. Yeah. And he said, I would prefer to stay here forever. And I asked him why, what it was that he liked about it. And he said, I get my work done. He said, I have no distractions. Just put me in front of a computer and I'll do it. And he does. And he's the first one of all the children, I think, to get his work done. He's out of the house and he's playing tennis. Yeah, That's he's it. gone by seven o'clock in the morning. I got up and I'm like, where? he's gone already. Right. He's at our house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know where he is. I know where he is. <laughs> Like, yeah. Yeah. So, then you might get some uh, recruits for your new homeschooling yeah. program. I already have. I have. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure everybody is having the same homeschooling uh, homeschooling experience. So, so tell me as as you're as you're kind of sheltered together, and maybe thinking a little bit about how you're going to communicate your values around giving. 
um, you know, your living values, your Jewish values seem to be well communicated, but have you had those kind of giving by design conversations and how does that work intergenerationally? Because Mem, I imagine things that you care about might not be the same in your charitable giving as your daughter's. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely fair. And in fact, Suzanne and I often have this conversation because I won't say she doesn't value what we did, but I'm she critical. does, very critical. And what she says is that she thinks if our generation had done a better job with the Jewish community, communicating the knowledge, communicating the knowledge that she herself wouldn't have to be working so hard at it. Mm -hmm. And there's some truth to that. Although I do say, you know, the American dream of that melting pot, we succeeded here in America, there's no question. And it's hard to but know at if, at, yeah, yeah, at what cost and would it have ever been any different than it is. Mm -hmm. And the generations haven't played out yet. We right. don't know, what we, the next we don't really know what the right. next generation right. or how, how they will raise their kids. Certainly we are not the norm, so, mm -hmm. um, you know. And in answer to your giving, we don't, we don't well, sit it's not, around talking it's not, about it. Well, giving. it's, we don't as a family, at this point sit around talk, talking about philanthropy or what we're doing or missions and so forth. But in our immediate family with our daughter, who's now 21, we do have these conversations. And we have over the years had formal conversations around funding projects and what does it take? And, and we talk about it much like you would talk about being the CEO of a company. You know, you have a responsibility to your employees, your community. You have to research all of the different kinds of organizations that are out there. Write a mission statement. Um, do your homework. Put prep in. You know, it's all about how much prep. You're only going to be a good funder because of the amount of people you talk to, the level of collaboration, and the knowledge that you gain about the organizations that you're considering funding. And the people. It's all about the people. So those are very formal conversations that we have had for at least the last 10 years with her, I would say. Um, and now she herself is, um, she's, if you said to her, you know, what organization are you passionate about? She would immediately, immediately be able to tell you. I also, I would say that during this time, I think that our kids are very much made aware of the experience that they're having being here in the sun or in Hawaii. Yeah. Um, and not usual. although it is difficult, you know, stress and anxiety doesn't discriminate. Everyone has an opportunity to feel it. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic background is. Um, but they are having a difficult time not seeing their friends. And yet at the same time, we're modeling for them how we can give back in this time. We've had our kids write cards to the school, to emergency providers here in, on the island. They see Tony and myself constantly zooming six hours a day to larger communities to help support in any way that we can with our time, with our experience, with our tools and with our parenting. So they see that because they have to get out of the living room where the, best, the Wi-Fi is best <laughs> and go into a corner and lock their door and be quiet for an hour or two. <laughs> and that just happens a, just a several, in itself. several hours a week. And, you know, they might complain from time to time. And I said, well, this is what, this is, we are being called to serve right now. And mommy you or daddy's residence right. is, needs to be available. So they and do see Jen it. Jennifer and I had a conversation the other day we, my first husband and I always talked to our children about what we were doing, how, who we were giving to, what we were giving, why we were giving. It was always the conversation. We never expected anything that we were doing not to be part of their lives. And so they grew up and it became part of their lives. I, I didn't know that would happen, but it happened. And I think that's a very big part of it. We were always involved in the conversation. Um, sometimes we were asked advice about kids. What do you think we should do? What would you do if you were given this opportunity? So from a very young age, we were brought into that conversation, which was important. And then at the same time, we were discussing recently how, although we don't give together, we each have an opportunity to give separately. And I think our parents made that available to us so that we could have the conversation with them while they were still living. Mm. And that is something that has been invaluable. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hearing a multiple, uh, multiple different approaches. Uh, Suzanne's approach seems to be much more around, you know, um, a thoughtful, intentional decision making, exposure, preparation. Um, you're pointing, Jennifer, to role modeling. 
um, men, you're talking almost like a mimetic sort of, this is just the way that we, we talk. This is our conversation and, and our kids were involved in it and empowered by it. Um, I'm wondering, well, I'm wondering a few things. One is I'm wondering about your passion projects. I, everyone's talking about a passion project, but I'm wondering about a passion um, in terms of a philanthropic um, project that each of you may have. And I want to think a little bit about giving across the generations because I imagine that, ma'am, your style of giving or perhaps the um, your your projects may be different and reflect some generational changes. And we might see that your 21-year-old, Suzanne, might be interested in, 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 um, in other giving. We, we have lots of sociological research about ways in which Jews identify and ways in which Jews give and how those things are different. And I'm wondering if you could, you know, share a project and also speak to the difference in your generation looking back and looking forward. Um, I would just say a few things. It's not only philanthropic dollars, but oftentimes I will get involved and be a contributor as a human being as I was saying before. So a perfect example of this is the Nexus Global Summit is an organization created by a Jewish woman named Rachel Gerald Cohen. And she recognized that governments can affect change in the way that philanthropists put together with social change makers and innovative entrepreneurs can. And joining this group probably nine years ago now, nearly nine years ago, I've become very involved and I created a Shabbat program and the summit usually goes over a Thursday, Friday and finishes on Saturday. And, or actually I think it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we finish with Shabbat. And in that Shabbat, it's not a Jewish organization. We do our Shabbat ritual, but we invite people from all traditions to come and to share a prayer from their own traditions. We have Muslims, Christians, Jews, American Indians. I mean, it's just, such an extraordinary thing to witness and we all break bread together and that really comes from my jewish soul you know tikkun olam how can we repair the world together um how can we get past our beliefs and recognize that we're all human beings and affect progressive change together so that is something where i am actively involved guiding and mentoring members of the community but also putting my resources towards something which represents a positive aspect of being Jewish and also inviting other people in to share in our tradition. Mm. Beautiful. Um, well, we've taken a little bit of a radical departure, mostly um, for, well, for a variety of reasons. And then I guess it was a good idea because COVID has sort of prevented us from funding the kind of experiential um, uh, mm -hmm. environments that we have funded for the past 10 years. So primarily for the past 10 years, we've been funding millennial driven events. So we've done pop-up Shabbat dinners pretty much at all music festivals um, around the country and even around the world. Um, Midburn in Israel, we've done a tent, um, Burning Man here in the United States, Coachella, Lighten a Bottle, all, all sorts of, wherever there's a, a millennial, we go to find them to give them a rich Jewish experience, to make those moments more meaningful because that is the Jewish sort of circuit. What I mean, it's not the Jewish circuit, but it's the circuit that those millennials are on and we're trying to create some Jewish moments at, at those locations. Since then, since COVID though, um, my new passion, but it's, it's a little bit deeper. Um, it's, it's got a longer tail and it happened even years ago that I've just resurrected is an on and now it's just ripe for the opportunity is an online jewish um sunday school basically a mini wexner for high school kids that have had a jewish day school, day school experience and graduated in eighth grade from a jewish day school but go on to a secular high school because high school those are the years when these kids create identities and are asking the hard questions and figuring out you know, the tough stuff. And they are not in a Jewish day school to do that. And I've had, my older daughter went to a Jewish high school and my middle daughter is now going to be entering a secular high school. And I wanted to make sure that her Judaism was still very much front and center. Can I interrupt for yes. a minute? Suzanne had the experience that when she sent 
her oldest one, wanted, she wanted her to have community. So in addition to the fact that she was in a Jewish day school, she sent her to Sunday school at her synagogue. But they weren't prepared for her because the, her education was too strong for the Sunday school. So what Suzanne is looking to do is supplement for those kids who don't go on to Jewish high school, or, or even for those who do, a Sunday school program that would have content, good Jewish content. And very out of very innovative content. Um, not just partial, and I'm actually writing the curriculum with a few other people right now, which is amazing, um, but it's very, very relevant. And it will be at a very high level um, and culturally literate. And that's the, actually the hardest part. And those are the conversations that we've been having. Mm -hmm. While I love all of the, um, I'm not gonna name organizations, but while I love all <laughs> of the content that is out there from, um, long-standing amazing educators they could no sooner speak to my teenagers to save their life right. because the gap of where they live in the world they live in and the world my teenager lives in are vastly different and if you don't have a community to support yeah, it right. and if you don't have so, the families and, and this isn't family just a do. course it's right. something i'm hoping that these kids you know i say that the way i carry my my bible around my tanakh around with you know 20 i don't know 40 years of notes in it, we're creating their Tanakh for them so that they will have a physical binder that's created over the four years that they're in this program. And they will hopefully open that binder when they get to college and they'll have this group of kids. It's much, it's much like we say when our kids go off to college, they'll meet their camp friends, right? So I'm hoping that we're creating something like that, that they can draw upon this so that in a, in a difficult situation or a tough day, they can either pick up the phone or you know, text a friend or pick up the binder. And um, I think it's also interesting, it really isn't about your age. It's really just about how you, what you know about cultural literacy today, because it is interesting that the 20 years between myself and my daughter, we're tw I'm 20 years apart from my mother and I'm 20 years apart from my daughter. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that the gap of 20 years between my mother and I is much greater in the way, in our lifestyle than my, my older daughter. So no, my daughter, my older daughter, you know, I go to Coachella, I go to Burning Man. I, you know, I'm living a, par a more parallel life to her life experience. Right, I'm at the net. And, right, and, <laughs> and I still go to the opera, don't worry, I and still I'm at home. Right. Still go to the opera. But it is a right. very interesting, yes. um, no, can I especially with technology. So Suzanne and I have been throwing programs at one another, because I know she wants to do this. I've been throwing programs at her all week long, and I'm getting the conversation that not good would never, <laughs> and she's not wrong. She's not wrong. It's, it's, the, it's, just, it's just the quality. It's different you know? today. Kids yeah. take in information differently. And you have about four seconds to give them the information right. and the content you're trying oh. to give them. So if you lose them in the third second, you're in trouble. Right. But right. I will, I mean, I have to do, like I have to say, because it happened this week and it's such a rare experience that I'm, I'm going to plug it. Um, from Open Door Media, D-O-R as in generation, Open Door Media, if you're looking for it on YouTube, um, if there are any teenagers out oh, there. Oh, come on, if we're going to start those you, right. um, I, I'm just really so excited for their new series um, that rolled out just a, d yesterday, uh, Unpacked, rolled out um, a series, and you can look it up. I won't say anything. Okay, so it. I just just yeah. saying, but I all, but, but I it's also, a media company right. that is, it's excellence oh, okay. from the top down. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, right. I'm Jennifer, what did I say? Uh, I'm great. I'm fine. <laughs> Look, the truth of the matter is passion for me. It's, uh, I'm in the business now. You know, I'm in the business of philanthropy. And so with Avichai having stopped its grant making, I'm moving into the Tikva zone now. Mm -hmm. And this has been an incredible experience for Tikva, this online learning. And the courses are terrific and the teachers are terrific but it is for a different audience than the audience that Suzanne is talking about. There's no question. And I think they're great. Absolutely great. Whether now they what are the starting. Uh, and well, I think for TICFA, the, except for the high school programs, I think that the TICFA programs are online learning more for adults. 
I do. They're more well, adult. It's, it's, but they do have TIFFIC programs for high school students and they're going into the junior high school market. And that's also fine. And they're great, but they're different because they're right. also much more elite. They choose a very high level student. Suzanne wants to open hers up to any kid. And it's not mm -hmm. elite. It's not elite. Those, those, the TIFFA programs are geared. They can say that they're not, but I, I, I've been, you know, I've been watching some Let's of them. And you have here. to know, you have to know, <laughs> you have to know more than the average right. American Jew to <laughs> have any idea. The yeah, lingo, right. the lingo right. wouldn't, I mean, you wouldn't have this, you wouldn't have an understand. If they said Bray sheet, you know. Some kids wouldn't have and an understanding. I would chime in to say that Torah study and learning and being Jewish isn't there's it's not a one-size-fits-all right. mm -hmm. and I have a lot of friends that are inspired because we invite people to our Friday night Shabbats frequently in normal times Jewish and non-Jewish actually we inspired a dear non-Jewish friend too she then converted and her daughter had a bat mitzvah and it was the whole thing because she loved the connection that happens in a family through our Jewish traditions but I was going to say was there if you are interested you know Never judge a religion by the people that practice it <laughs> because personality conflict gets involved. Mm -hmm. And no matter, depending on who you were raised and who was giving you Jewish or who wasn't giving you Jewish, you always have an opportunity to learn from any starting point. So whether it's going online and looking up Jewish speakers, ah, you go online and there are a few, or you pick up the Tanya or you find your local rabbi. There is always a class or a lecture online to do privately, always an opportunity to learn yeah, right. in the most meaningful way, even like Chabad.org. They'll send you a little Parsha every week, the portion of the week that we learn to um, use the, the lessons from the Torah to apply to our daily lives, right? right? Yeah. It's yeah, we're very fortunate that we live in a time where there's a real saturation of opportunities for every age, for every level, um, Suzanne, I just kudos to you. Um, I one of my first jobs was actually running a Sunday school for juniors and seniors in pre in prep schools uh, who did not have the benefit of Jewish education. And I can say that this past Monday night when I taught my class, I used a book written by one of my students. So it was just it's a very lovely moment um, where you can see sometimes the impact, not always, uh, but sometimes the stories come back to you. So kolakavod, uh, congrats, and uh, keep at it. Um, Mem, you said something to me that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, you talked about trusting your daughters and trusting the next generation to make good decisions. Um, I know, for example, in um, the Jewish Future Pledge, the idea of, of, of passing on your wealth, but also saying a large portion of this wealth needs to go to the Jewish community and saying, I trust that you will make a good decision. And you, you said that not everyone does that. Not every philanthropist trusts in their children. And that creates, that creates some dissonance in terms of the path that they take. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Of course. Um, look, I, I think that I raised my children, so I know my children, and I was happy to trust them young and to do good things. And however, at the same time, I thought that they, not however, and I thought that they would be able to run their own funds by themselves. And so we set them up young for them and they started to do that. I we did, 20. right, they were 20. I mean, how young got right. right. some, right. <laughs> they were 20. But I also think that they, um, I lost my train of thought, but it's coming back. Trust. Right, what I wanted to say was, I did set out guidelines. They did know that along with this money came the Jewish, and, the, and I meant it. I didn't mean for them to take this money and spend it on things that were not Jewish. And Rec I, recognizing that, you know, the Jews will support the Jews, the non-Jews right. won't always as often support the Jewish people. And so we have to look after our right. communities first or they will fall away. Right. And I, and I sent that to them in a letter. So they knew that. And their funds were set up with that in mind. And look, I have funded them periodically, so it's not like it all is in the in the pot. And I could have always withdrawn, not withdrawn the funds, but withdrawn my trust in them, but I never had to. I'll, I'll interject and say, you know, my mother would never say, take your coat. Or she would say it one time, and then she would let go, and you'd learn that you were cold, and next time you would take your coat. And it's really an important lesson, because she trusted us. She would say comments like, 
sweetheart, I know you'll make the right decision. I taught you what you need to know. Now go for it. You know, it wasn't, they're oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. Great. <laughs> yeah, they're great. So, yeah. um, we should be on television more. <laughs> right. No, they're good. They're very, I, they're good. Next. What? Oprah's next. Oprah's next. Right. I think that the point that you make, though, about trusting your kids, and I know what you're referencing in sort of the Jewish world and the dynamic of, of money being passed down and changing hands to the next generation is that um, they, don't they don't trust. And, and I think that they don't trust for good reason. Right. I will also say that it's interesting that the majority of money that will pass hands, those individuals did actually did not grow up with any Judaism. So right. in my neck of the woods in, in the Bay Area, in Silicon Valley, most of the people that have the most amount of money did not inherit it. They made it. They made it themselves. And so therefore, that's why I'm inspired to educate on some level the, the responsibility of Jewish giving right, but even because I know they're going to give and, and whether or not they call that, whether or not they, they um, say they're giving because they're Jewish, even if it's to a non-Jewish organization, it's irrelevant to me. Those dollars are still going to a non-Jewish organization. But Suzanne made a point and, and left out a point that she's talked to me about often, which is not only did they make this money on their own, but they weren't raised in Jewish homes, although they were Jewish. So right. when parents don't trust their children, they have to look at themselves and say, what didn't I give my children that I can't trust my children? Well, and I don't think it's ever too late. You, right. give, no, you give trust, well, you get trust. That's right. And there, right? I know that in my husband's family, from a very young age, they give children you know, a discretionary amount, call it $10,000 a year or something like that. And either the grandchildren can come together and work something out and do a, a project um, in collaboration, or they can give something individually on their own. But from a very young age, there are meetings once, once a month about how taking care of your community is very important. So, and I will say that, I mean, you know, the, the data that I know, I would say probably 90% of Jewish day schools and Jewish high schools have um, giving classes. So they, they teach the kids in the day schools how to do the research and they pull money and they go through an experience of being a funder. And while I appreciate the knowledge, they generally do not tell the kids that all of the money has to go to Jewish organizations. Mm -hmm. And I, over the years, have gotten very, um, you know, very strict with the schools where my kids are attending because I've said, I, you know, I love that, that you want to give to the SPCA and so forth and so on, and those are worthy causes. However, this is a young child, and I need my children in, at this time in their life to know that there's a Jewish response to basically any organization that you're funding or even looking in Israel. Right. And so I've gotten very, um, as a board member, I've, I've gotten very um, strict about making sure that, you know, if, they, if they're still going to have organizations featured that are not Jewish, it has to be a 30-70 split. Okay. And it can't be a 50-50. And certainly when I, at some years, it was 90% of the money went to non-Jewish organizations. While I appreciate that, this is a school environment. Right. So, um, you know, this is our, our, our last question, although I could talk to you uh, for, for the whole afternoon. Um, you know, when you're thinking about a Mother's Day present, and, you know, you, you think I about... I just had mine. I just had mine. This was mine. <laughs> this was yours. Um, you know, the idea of passing down your wisdom, instead of waiting for someone to give you something, seeing Mother's Day as a chance and maybe a charge, for Jewish mothers to actually say, this is what Judaism means to me. So I'm wondering if I could ask each of you to, in a sentence or two, fill, fill out this prompt. I am Jewish because, and I'm gonna ask Jennifer if you can start. I am Jewish because. Uh, I am Jewish because um, I have learned to understand that it allows me to move in this direction, closer to the source of myself in my practice of mitzvot. Beautiful. Ma'am? I'm Jewish because I was born Jewish and the idea of giving up such a treasure 
would be just too painful for me. It wouldn't even be something I could consider. I think it's such an honor. And I'm always so sad for those who don't feel that. Thank you. Suzanne? I, I would say first and foremost, because um, I have the privilege of being born Jewish. And I then had the very fortunate um, opportunity to have parents that um, described and modeled what the gift was. And because I then took the gift for myself, I understand what the gift meant. And therefore, like my mom says, I can't, I, I, I do, I often, especially when I have friends whose parents die, you know, even yesterday, and I, and they're not Jewish, and I see how difficult it can be to make rhyme or reason of death and um, the process that we have in Judaism um, is just, it's just incredible. It's I really mean, that we're always, the soul is always first and foremost, and um, our moral code is first and foremost. And we, you know, Judaism, if, if practiced at any level, can create a great human. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's what I tell my kids, you know, is that, for whatever reason, we didn't invent it, but we were lucky enough to be born into it. And, you know, it really is plain and simply, that's what I say to my kids. I said, you know, it, it makes great humans. And yeah. so- I would say through its know, practice, you right, become yeah. the best version of yourself. Of yourself right? yeah. And then it makes us accountable to how we treat each other, yeah. respect yeah. and honor your parents, respect and honor each other. So this, it's, it's interesting, Erica, you, you said about the counting, because I, um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the way in which my friends are counting the days of, of being in shelter. And counting in Judaism is, as we know, something that is so profound. We, we are a numbers, we count numbers, we have sacred numbers, we have sacred moments, and the Omer counting, the Omer... And I'm sure there are going to be a million people talking about the fact that for some reason, 49 days of the Omer is, is really what is all that the soul can take possibly. And here we are now at 52 days. Right. So now what, what is the unraveling or the unpacking that will happen post the 49? And, and yet the thing that is most precious to us, we're not meant to count in Judaism, right? <laughs> is that we don't count, right? right. right. Okay. You know, the interesting thing, I don't know why it comes to my mind, but it, this is real. Jennifer came to me yesterday and said that her husband was taking down a bird's nest in their home and one of her kids was so upset about it. And I said to her, you know, Jen, there's a halakha about the bird's nest and when you can take the bird's nest down, you know, not in front of the one, wow. you know, and that's what our lives are like. You, you want to draw from just to clarify there was no nest up there no no and I, I he wasn't. never would have been allowed to take no no down. that's not the but point. the birds were starting to make one right no, no that, that, the point i was making was that if you're right. living life right. it, intention it yeah. comes to your head Definitely. it comes into Definitely. your mind you have a and conscience you are, yeah you have a conscience you live with a conscience and you talk about it yeah i don't have we don't i don't think i mean i'll speak for myself i don't think i have a choice when i look at the world i see it through a jewish lens Me too. and i got that from my parents and that is 150% of what I want to pass down to my kids. I want to make sure when they look through their eyes that they see it through a lens of Judaism. And Which however a person right. defines that. But for me, I need them to be able to step out of themselves and be able to put themselves in somebody else's shoes on a daily basis. I will say to my children, I care less about the profession in which you find yourself each day or in the future. I care most about the human being you are in every moment with another human being. And the funny thing and is- And that comes from Judaism. And I heard her oldest son say that the other day, and I, had to, yeah, I had to laugh yeah. because he was quoting her, you know, it was great. It's not good when they spit it back at you. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it's very lovely. It sounds like uh, your children are absorbing the important messages that you have to send them. Uh, it's been really a delight to speak with the three of you. Um, a delight to watch you laugh together, to see the joy that's evident in your relationship and how intentional 
you're all working um, to build a Jewish world that's more compassionate and thoughtful and to pass that down to your children. I really want to thank you for everything that you do for the Jewish people. It's really- and anyone can contribute their time. You don't right. have to have I, I have to, to say, so. I'm so embarrassed not to have said this before. I have a son, my daughters have a brother, <laughs> and he too is very giving in his Jewish way and only to Jewish. It's well, nice. maybe we'll be back at him at Father's Day, but for now. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.